I'm really pleased to invite um, Chloe Edwards, who's the Trust Director of Nature Recovery. Chloe has been with us since February, um, joined us from Kent Wildlife Trust, where she was Head of Wilder Landscapes and brings a wealth of experience. And um, Chloe is heading up all of our work in the wider countryside, nature reserves, the record centre, our planning work. So it's quite a big remit. So over to you, Heidi. To, uh, Heidi, sorry, Chloe, to tell us tell us about the wider landscape work. Thank you. Um, what a what a bunch of speakers to have to follow. Uh, amazing. Uh, the the Wilderhood Watch project is really special. That was really amazing to hear about. Um, Thank you for having me here. I'm new, um, so I won't know a lot of your faces, but I'm really looking forward to working with you all more. Uh, and I was asked to share some thoughts around landscape scale conservation. So uh, I'm going to try and do that um, environment. We've got to do it at scale, and to, that's got to enable an action that is commensurate with the dual challenges we're facing with the nature and climate crises, which Craig beautifully outlined at the start. So landscape scale conservation is one of the things that we can work with. It's not a new concept by any means, so many of you will be familiar with many of the things I'm going to say today. Um, you'll be familiar probably with a living landscape approach, which was the Wildlife Trust um, interpretation of how landscape scale might work for us as a movement. Um, but you'll also probably be familiar with um, a bit of a mantra there that we've got that came out of the Making Space for Nature Review in 2010 by John Lawton. Uh, and that was very much highlighting that to take a landscape scale approach, we need wildlife habitats that are bigger, better, and more joined up. And that's certainly been a theme that's been running through all of our work for many decades now. Um, Despite all the fantastic efforts that we've been doing over the last few decades, and we've been doing landscape conservation brilliantly um, to date, we know that we're still losing wildlife, uh, and that's happening at an alarming rate, as we've already heard today. Just this morning, we had some more evidence come out from butterfly conservation, saying that half of Britain's remaining butterfly species are now listed as threatened or near-threatened on a new red list published today. So we've got to reverse these declines and we've got to think big. And while we're doing it, this is very basic, but I'll go over it, and I love an animation, so forgive me. Um, you know we're fantastic with our water valve conservation work here in Hearts and Middlesex. Uh, and what we're doing is we're trying to reconnect habitats. We're trying to make those landscapes more resilient. And essentially, we're trying to enable um, wildlife to navigate those landscapes. So we reconnect them, we restore habitats, and then that landscape is permeable, um, which is the ultimate aim. Um, so I thought it was just useful. Obviously, I'm new to the county. Um, and forgive me, Middlesex, because this just covers this example is Hertfordshire. Um, <laughs> that's, doesn't mean anything, it's just my mapping skills. Um, I thought it was really useful to look at our county in terms of building blocks for nature, nature's recovery. We have this ambition of 30% of land managed uh, for nature by 2030. So what does that kind of look like on the ground? Uh, we've obviously got our fantastic river network there and our human man-made network of roads as well, which I will mention going forwards. So in our core sites, we've got our nature reserves, Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust nature reserves, you can see there. We've also got nature reserves that are managed by other environmental NGOs. Uh, again, this isn't comprehensive, it's the data that I could find. Um, so here we've got uh, folks like the Woodland Trust, RSPB and National Trust represented. We know we can deliver brilliant returns for nature across this network. Those areas are under our control. But in order to realise the aspirations that we have around 30 by 30, it's influencing the management of the wider landscape that is really critical. So we can add on to here our statutory protected sites. So these are things like triple SIs, which many of you will be familiar with. We've also got this incredible network of local wildlife sites in Hertfordshire. They cover something like 13,000 hectares, which is astounding. A massive opportunity, but currently, less than 12% of them are under conservation management. So that's one to put in the huge potential pot. So 
So these things collectively, so our nature reserves, the protected sites, local wildlife sites, which are gems in the landscape, you know, the local wildlife sites don't have the protection of our statutory ones, uh, but they are equally as good um, and all of the potential there. We need to protect these sites from harm, we need to improve them through good management, and we need to, where possible, increase their size as well. Then there's huge opportunity within the landscape. You'll see there's lots of white spaces in amongst all of these core sites for nature. There's a lot of other land that isn't protected by legislation, that isn't a local wildlife site. Uh, lots of it may be local authority owned. Lots of it might be golf courses, like we've heard about today from Howard. And then we've got a whole bunch of parks and open spaces as well. And the potential to increase um, Increase land managed for nature with this network is huge. We need to improve the way these sites are managed for nature. So there's still quite a lot of white space here. Lots of this will be farmland. Um, in Hertfordshire, we've got an awful lot of farmland. Uh, about 90,000 hectares of our county in Hertfordshire is covered by it. Uh, so there's a huge opportunity there. And also, we've already heard about the Wildhood Watch and sort of doing actions within communities that will enable stepping stones or corridors for wildlife. So there are some things that I think we can look at, and we've heard about some of them already, but we'll go over them again, uh, in order that we reduce this white space, essentially, make a more connected, resilient landscape where wildlife can navigate and where we benefit from all the services that this connected landscape can bring us. So how can we make what we have wilder? Uh, we've got lots of assets in our landscape. Uh, I mentioned our road network. Um, that's fairly substantive uh, in Hertfordshire. Um, and it has already compromised the permeability of the landscape to many species. But it can be improved. The connectivity can be improved. Uh, and roadside nature reserves are a way of doing that. And it's something that's been done brilliantly in other parts of the wildlife movement. Uh, and we need to look at that. So uh, if you look at Lincolnshire or Kent, they've got fantastic roadside nature reserve networks. We can also really up our ambitions and think about connectivity across roads. Um, so over in Europe, they're fantastic at navigating roads with uh, green bridges, wildlife bridges, eco-ducts, whatever you want to call them. So we can look at that. And then we've already heard with Wilderhood Watch about these insect-rich habitats, the buzz stops, um, which might seem like a really small intervention, but if you can do those at scale, they could be really transformational as stepping stones in urban settings. And then we've got our open spaces. And this is just for inspiration. So this is Alstree Park in Derby, where they're doing a flagship project uh, with Derby City Council and Derbyshire Wildlife Trust, which is set to be the biggest urban rewilding project. Uh, and whether you like the term rewilding or wilding, it doesn't really matter uh, what we call these approaches. It's just about reassessing what we need from our green spaces. So these are some images of their vision for this um, park space in the city. Uh, we want wildlife-rich habitats in these spaces. We want them to lock up carbon, and we want to provide more opportunities for residents of those places to improve their well-being by connecting with nature-rich green space. Then that's what we need to do. Also, we have to mention, uh, earlier this year, beavers returned inside of the M25. This is an amazing achievement. An ecosystem engineer and another tool that we really have to consider where it's appropriate in our plan to put nature into recovery in the county. What we also have to do is look at the farmed environment. And there is growing recognition, you know, that collaborative working in a geographic area will achieve more than working in isolation. Farmer clusters or groups are increasingly being demonstrated as a collaborative means to achieve landscape scale conservation outcomes and mutual goals. The key to enabling all of this is having a facilitator. Um, so that can be someone, it could be a farmer, it could be a conservation organization, and that person is pivotal in keeping momentum and coordinating action on behalf of the group. 
I really believe that pharma clusters and groups are a key delivery vehicle for nature restoration and that to successfully influence the farmed environment, there's got to be an element of co-design of projects um, so that everyone is bought into those projects from the start. And it's also a model that can be transferred beyond the farmed environment to capture a much broader suite of landowners and managers. This uh, pictures here are from a farmer cluster in Kent, where I used to work, which came about very organically. Um, and the farmers are using novel um, conservation techniques and regenerative farming to enhance the landscape. They're taking um, advantage of countryside stewardship and other funding mechanisms, and they're aiming to deliver landscape scale enhancements. And they're also working with a local recording group. They actually won a National Biodiversity Network Group Award last year for their fantastic work. So that's really something to aim for, and I'm sure there's lots of organic groups in Hertfordshire of landowners and farmers, so it would be fantastic to hear about those and what you need to be supported in delivering more of them. I told you I go OTT with the animations. Um, <laughs> It's also important to bear in mind that our funding landscape um, is evolving. Um, so we still have a lot of the uh, traditional funding routes available to us to fund nature recovery. But we've also got a lot of new ones coming in. Um, and a lot of these are new and emerging nature-based solutions type funding streams. Um, here we go. We've also got biodiversity net, net gain, which is a huge opportunity. Uh, if it's done right. But what we need is a better framework to direct our efforts and all of this potential investment to give us the best return for nature. So that just leads on to creating a nature recovery network, which is an ambition that was set out in DEFRA's 25-year plan. And um, a couple of years later, the Wildlife Trust came out with a handbook, which sort of said, this is how you do that. Um, so that was 2020. This is a national network, but it will be delivered through local nature recovery strategies, which Leslie mentioned briefly earlier. Um, and these are a flagship measure in our Environment Act now. I'm going to whiz through this because I know I'm pretty much out of time. Um, and there are a new system of space, spatial strategies um, for nature that will plan, map, and help drive a more coordinated, practical focused action on the ground and help build that national nature reserve. And I think this is a huge opportunity. I know many people have been skeptical about this process. We've had quite a long history of opportunity mapping and the like in various guises over the last few decades. And there's no denying that there are some similarities here, but there are also some critical differences, such as the desire to foster some true collaboration at the core of this process and also in the inherent aim to have a broader focus around the wider environmental benefits. And this is, these are the differences that our responsible authority, um, that's Hearts County Council, really need to make sure that we don't lose sight of when we're lining up the skills to deliver this. There's lots of opportunity for linking into existing networks, um, which helps negate the need to obviously build new relationships. And um, I just want to then just highlight that whilst this is a piece of work that I think could be really pivotal in coordinating and directing our efforts, uh, we mustn't lose sight of that these things in themselves are not going to deliver anything and that time is ticking on. Um, I also think we really shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we've done a lot. So we've done so much incredible work. Um, again, this, this list is not exhaustive, so if your logo's not on there, apologies. Uh, I just wanted to demonstrate in my few short months that I've been in post, uh, the amount of work being undertaken is completely overwhelming. It's fantastic. Uh, we're doing so much in partnership, so much in collaboration. Uh, and we've got to look at that and reflect and take our learnings forward as part of that process. Um, that picture there is part of our Living Rivers work. We've been doing that for 10 years this year, which is amazing. We've delivered some incredible gains for the county's waterways. And let's not forget we have 10% of England's chalk rivers in our counties. And also, maybe we need to think critically about what hasn't worked in the past. We used to have a local nature partnership. Maybe we need to think, 
why that didn't work, how could we do it better, and do we need another forum to facilitate this collaborative action at a county scale? We've got a really great starting point, is really my point there. Uh, and just finally, moving on to a, a bit of a challenge, really. Monitoring is something that really gets left behind a little bit, I feel, in conservation. It's always a bit of an afterthought, and I'm really keen that we try and drive some forward thinking before we set out on a process. Um, so landscape scale conservation is combined multiple actions on multiple sites by multiple stakeholders. That is a really complex <laughs> place to be. Uh, we're very much used to monitoring at a site scale, uh, but landscape scale monitoring is very much in its infancy by comparison. I was part of a project in Kent which started to look at addressing some of these challenges of monitoring at this scale. Um, so we have a lot of work that's been done to build on. Um, and the other challenge as well goes back to my previous slide, and that really is about the amount of work going on. Um, so there's a wealth of conservation work being undertaken by everyone here in this room, but we haven't got a place to go that brings that all together. Me being very new to the counties, I couldn't just go to one place and figure out everything that was going on in the county. So perhaps we want to consider some kind of comprehensive, easily accessible way of doing that. Again, we tried something in Kent, that definitely wasn't perfect, but there's lots of thinking around that that we can evolve. I promise I'm going to stop talking, Emma. <laughs> um, just my last slide then. So when I was putting this together, uh, I came across a presentation from 2008, uh, which was talking about landscape scale conservation, living landscapes. And these were things that were flagged that we needed to do. And I've stuck the word continue in front of them because they're still as valid now as they were then. But I've got a few extra to add. Uh, one of them is about challenging our assumptions, and that goes back to how we engage people. And we've had a great um, example today with the Wilderson Auburns project of how we can go about engaging people in towns and cities much differently. And I mentioned about farmer clusters and how that's an opportunity to challenge the assumptions we have about knowing what people need and what motivates them to take action. And so that goes to including a much broader range of stakeholders in our work. As I've mentioned already, we need to learn from adapt and adapt our processes. Learning is so valuable. We don't need to reinvent the wheel on a lot of this, but we can iteratively evolve it. We also need to consider monitoring and what are our measures of success. So how will we know if we've met our 30 by 30? What's that going to look like? And then finally, just really not letting perfection be the enemy of the good. Uh, we've heard a lot about how we are in the, a nature and climate crisis. We've got to take action now. We really don't have a choice but to pull together and do this. So let's get on with it, really. <laughs> um, right, thank you very much. I will stop now.